We are here with Fazla, who represented Bosnia in 1993 with the country's first Eurovision entry, All the Pain in the World. He is now a senior official in the Bosnian government. Fazla, welcome. Thank you guys for the invitation. And thank you for the opportunity to remember what was happening 30 years ago. What was your relationship to Eurovision growing up? It was very popular in the former Yugoslavia. I happened to be neighbor of the guy who represented Yugoslavia in 1973, Dravko Trojic. I was, what, six or seven years old when he was representing Yugoslavia. So from that point on, Eurovision was important in our social life. You've been a professor, you've been a politician, you've been a musician and artist. Um, how early did you know you wanted to be a, a, a musician? Was this a, a childhood dream? It was solely by accident, to be honest with you. I was playing football and I had a pretty good social life. So I had the opportunity like to know the big stars in the Balkans. Usually on after parties, you know, I would sing song or two and then they start to, you cannot know, joke around anymore. <laughs> it's not enough to be a sort of football player or, or fashion show model. You got to start thinking about this seriously. Step by step, I was kind of dragged into it. So uh, my Eurovision song, The Whole World Spain, was my second song I ever recorded. Oh, really? I was really lucky. Like, first song that I recorded was present to me from Hari Matahari, Leila, 2006, oh. and Dino Merli. Right, who also wrote All the World's Pain with you, right? That's right. Yes. I was really fortunate enough to know those guys, and they were willing to put together a good song for me. So. All the Pain uh, in the World is such a powerful song, so can you talk about the process of recording and rehearsing it while your country was being attacked? In Sarajevo, we had so many artists, and we kind of decided we're going to defend our country with what we do the best. We explained in the form of song how we felt at the time. So we had so many people writing the songs and trying to record in order to support our army, to support our people, to endure the worst aggression since World War II in European soil. We were talking about this phenomenon of divided families. So many people had at the time girlfriends, wives, kids. We started developing that story. Basically, I think the only place with, with the electricity was hotel, and we went to that hotel because it had electricity. I think we made demo probably in a couple hours. So you win the national final, right? And then the next step is the qualification round. And you have to get out of Bosnia. Sarajevo's under lockdown. As you know, Sarajevo was under the siege longer than Stalingrad in Russia during the World War II. So it was really difficult. The only way you could break out of the city was to run across the airport runway. Basically, we kind of used deception. We knew that Serbian uh, forces are watching the, some competition. So what we did, we recorded some competition day earlier. So let's say we recorded Friday night, we knew I won. So during the broadcasting, we were running across the runway. So it was really muddy. It was really dangerous. The night that we were running across the runway, I think six people got killed and 17 wounded. It was really difficult because United Nations forces wouldn't let you. Really? No, they wouldn't. You know. Their mandate was uh, to keep the airport under their control and not allow any forces to run across. Since it was really muddy and snowy, I lost my shoes right away when I started running. I mean, I believe it was late February or early March. I, I had to climb the Mount Enigma, which is pretty steep and, 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 and high. I think it's about... 1,700 meters above the sea level. So basically, I made it to the Mount Enigma barefoot. Incredible. But adrenaline was so high that I didn't even feel it. That's how pumped up I was. We got captured in the city of Mostar by the Croatian forces. So they kept us in the Mostar for a couple of days. What was it? What, I mean, what was it like being detained? Everything after Sarajevo looks like a Mickey Mouse. You had electricity, <laughs> you had water, you had food. Emotionally, you become numb to things like that. So I wasn't scared. I wasn't afraid. I know I'm Eurovision Song Competition representative. The whole world is going to know. But I mean, you know, it lasted for a couple of days. They let us go. So then we start getting wardrobe for the competition. Literally, I was muddy. Other national representatives, they had their dancing lessons and stuff. I mean, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> the, the, the Croatian delegation kept trying to undermine you, yeah? They wouldn't give us any point. We are representing exclusively Muslim side. So basically, Muslim color in Bosnia is green. 
And I had a green jacket and the chief of delegation of Croatia was telling me, please go ahead and sing in that jacket. It goes great with, with your eyes and everything else. So after I finished singing, we had a press conference. First question for, for Croatian journalists was, why did you sing in a green jacket? So I said, because I was so confident we're going to win this competition and we are going to Ireland and I know Ireland is country of green. It's good thinking on your feet. Yeah, that's yeah. actually, that's, that's a very smart way to turn it. Everybody knew what was she trying to accomplish. And you mentioned that Croatian's not giving you points, but before that, there was also sort of a, uh, an attempt at a vote trading offer. Uh, they were asking us, let's work together. They were going to give us maximum amount of points. We're going to give them maximum amount of points. From our side, we didn't have any problem giving them 10 points without any agreement. You know, we thought they had a good song and we're going to award them with 10 points. So they said they're going to do the same to us. So at the end, they didn't give a ton of points. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like in Ireland? And can you talk about the iconic moment when you turned your back to the audience? What did that symbolize to you? And was that always the plan? It wasn't always the plan. When we first started thinking about the whole concept of our presentation, we're going to represent our situation as we see it from our point of view. And our main goal was just to bring our story to the living rooms of such a large audience. As we saw how Europe created Bosnia, that basically was my idea to show to Europe how how bad it is when somebody turns back to you. The situation in the Balkans seems to be getting a little bit more worrisome. We primarily are speaking to an American audience on this podcast. And I think the impression initially was that Bosniaks were happy with Joe Biden's election, uh, both because it got rid of Trump, but also because of Biden's history in getting arms to Bosniaks during the war. But the impression that I get is that the administration has been a bit of a disappointment. I have to be very careful here because I'm senior advisor for the Bosnian president. Yes. I better make sure right, the right. audience understand that I'm not talking on behalf of him. Yes. On behalf of myself, Joe Biden was a great champion during the 90s, 30 years after that. He is my personal disappointment because they are trying to explain to us what is good for us. I think the thing that our listeners might not be familiar with is that there are three presidents, right, in Bosnia, and they're divided along the ethnic lines. That's right. One has to be from the Croat population. The other one has to be from the Bosnia. Right now, we have a pro-Bosnia and Croat in the presidency, but Zagreb is not accepted. It's election result because, as they said, he's not legitimate Croat. Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian Croats, and Bosniaks each vote for their own candidate. You hear that, you might think that these are similar size of people of the country, but it's not. And I think many attribute the vulnerability Bosnia has to the fact that Republika Srpska has the power it does within the country. 1995, Bosnia signed peace agreement with Croatia and Serbia, which stopped the war. Peace agreement was basis for a new government. So up to 2010, Bosnia had certain progression that we were all happy with. But recently, meddling of Croatia and Serbia, we are still under aggression. Just it's a different form of warfare. So just to talk about some of that aggression, you have Vucic's administration making noises about a greater Serbia, which for our listeners is similar to Putin's idea of a greater Russia. It basically means territorial expansion. Right. And then within the country, you have the Republika Srpska, right? They have been also making noises about unification. They're making noises about secession. Yes. This structure has existed for a while. Why are the tensions bubbling up now, do you think? Because this seems to reflect a broader issue in Europe. You have very aggressive actors like Putin. Even in the Balkans, you had the Montenegrin election. What do you think is going on? where we had a time of relative peace, and now it seems to be spiking again. Global picture is different. I think Europe is trying to be kind to Serbia because they are afraid they're going to go completely on the Russian side. Right. They know that Serbia is, for a long time, for two centuries, always on the Russian side. They didn't even impose sanctions against Russia. 
what kind of reform do you think is necessary? What we are doing right now, this type of government, government uh, European court saying it's illegal. European Union is asking us to implement 14 points. We said, let's do it. Then we would have civic state and we would be a normal country like every other country in Europe. To bring it back to Eurovision, this tripart structure has been part of the reason that Bosnia has not been back to Eurovision. It's the only reason actually why we are not going to Eurovision. Government, they don't want to finance. They are happy that we are not competing at Eurovision Song Competition because they are assuming if Croatia is there and Serbia is there, Serb ethnic population will pull and cheer and identify with the Serbian national song and Croats, ethnic Croats in Bosnia, they will identify with the Croat national they're trying to prevent Bosnia's national identity. Yep. This is like also a place, though, where I wonder if the EBU could be helpful. Bosnia is a democratic country that's the product of the values that, that the EBU talks about, individual self-determination, freedom. And the forces against you are the forces that the EBU says that they don't like, right? Territorial expansionists, warmongers. Um, has there been any conversation about the EBU providing financial help if these funds are really locked up by Republika Srpska and, and, and the Croatian? The reason why I'm doing what I'm doing at this point is to open up that conversation. That's going to be my task, and we'll see how far we'll, we'll get there. I'm going next month to Paris. Then afterwards, I'm going to Germany and Slovenia. So I'm going to open up some conversation. We are very excited for Bosnia to return to the competition, particularly given the success that the country's had. But I think there's probably a broader reason why you're dedicated to bringing Bosnia to Eurovision again. Edward Said has this idea of the right to narrate your own story. Who gets the permission to tell their story and who doesn't? And he was talking about Palestinians, but I think it also applies here. When I think about your journey to Eurovision, it really is about your journey to tell the story of, of the Bosnian people. And I think last time we talked, you used the phrase, uh, far from the eyes, far from the heart, right? Um, if people can't see what's going on, they won't care. You know how powerful media are yeah. right now. Going to Eurovision, some competition is a uh, good effort to represent in the best possible light. And we usually, we don't think about war, we don't think about oppression. We don't use Eurovision some competition for uh, exclusively social code. We mostly sing about love. The majority of our songs during the war were about the love under the impossible circumstances. I think in America, Eurovision is often thought of as like a campy, silly competition. Uh, but the history of the contest features so many moments like your performance, you know, where Eurovision almost acts like a public square, bringing voices that need to be heard to a broader audience. And they did a really great job in Liverpool, featuring Ukrainian voices and focusing on the conflict. They also released a statement this past contest saying that they were declining allowing Zelensky to speak. So how do you think Eurovision and the EBU should navigate situations like this? Politicians shouldn't be speaking at the Eurovision Song Competition. Nobody can articulate the nation better than our in my view. And if you go back in history, and we learn about so many nations through the artwork. It's a good decision by EBU that Zelensky shouldn't be speaking. Yeah. But I think Ukrainian artists, they have plenty of energy and creativity to portray for the rest of the world exactly what they feel and how they feel and what should be done in order to make them safe and happy. Any final thoughts or messages you want to leave our audience with? We just want to have a country like it's yours. We are just asking for Europe and the United States to help us out, just like every other normal country in the world. When Bosnia is back in Eurovision, I can't wait until the hosts say, and to read out the points from Bosnia, we're going to turn it over to Fazla, because I think that would be the way to bring it all full circle. Probably I'm going to be with the legation there. Okay, uh, there that's, we go. that's perfect, even Listen. better. I think that's the perfect place to end. Fazla, thank you so thank much you. for this interview. This has been really, really great. That's, it was fun. All the mysteries of the Euroverse.